hope everybody had a I was going to say had a good evening, but I hope you just had an evening, <laughs> an evening of something, <laughs> some things. Um, I was feeling you all so much last night and feeling the combination of, of bliss for having been able to connect with you through these technologically advanced ways and also the torture of how, how short our time is together and, um, you know, feeling the energy in the room and, and missing you. So I, I, I have both the, the deep joy of what Zoom in this case can afford us, combined with just missing contact and, um, and I love you. So let's start together today, if you're all up for it with a little grounding together, if you wanna attempt to put your feet on the ground and close your eyes if you want to, or keep them open and deep breath in through your nose together, just to land in this space together from the chapter that preceded this, <clears throat> the states, the emotional, physical, mental, spiritual states that preceded this and seeing what this moment will, um, will unveil for us together. So deep breath in through the nose together, one, two, three. Hold at the top and out through the mouth. We're going to do two more of these. And while we're doing it, I invite you to notice, keep breathing in through the nose. I invite you to notice, just drop into the inside of, the, of your body as though you're a character in the inner space movie and you're moving around the inside of your shoulders, the inside of your belly, the muscles, the ligaments, floating all the way from the top of your head down through your face and the back of your head and your ears, breathing in. Oh. Floating down over your shoulders, the front and back, your chest, clavicle, the beginning part of your upper ribs, giving extra love to the lungs, so much focus on lungs, down the arms, really bringing into the experience today your whole back body. So often because we can't see our back body, it's, it's hard to proprioceptively bring it into the party. But if and when you can, a deep breath into the whole back, your entire back, your seat, your hamstrings, your calves, your ankles, the bottoms of your feet, bottom, touching into any sort of sensation, color, <clears throat> movement, agitation, holding, numbness, if there's a color associated with any sensation too. Deep breath in. Hold. Deep breath out of your mouth. And then bringing your awareness back to your heart. Putting your hand on your heart if you want. And noticing the degree of comfort you may or may not have with showing this kind of tenderness physically to yourself with your hand on your chest. Is this something comfortable for you? Is this something awkward for you? Is this something relieving? Is there shame and self-love, self-care? Deep breath in. And then together, if you're not comfortable doing it with your camera on you, you can step away from the camera or move your camera away. 
but just collectively together doing some micro or medium movements of just shaking some of the energy. A lot of times it can be from the head moving, the arms moving, shoulders, just some movement even in your chair, your jaw, your hips, twirling your ankles, just really saying hello to this beautiful big bag of bones that is carrying us around this wild adventure of a short lifetime. <clears throat> Bringing it to life and then becoming still again. Deep breath in through the nose. Noticing your heartbeat, your lower belly where your muscles cover your intestines. And now if we want to pay attention to the upper part of our chest, really locating where, <clears throat> when we have any kind of anxiety or fear or terror, chronic or bursts of it, the whole continuum of just a quiet little fear all the way to the other end of the continuum, full-blown panic attack. In this moment, to locate the physical places where those manifestations of any kind of fear shows up and as best as you can putting your hand or both hands on different parts that get activated when there's fear and a little micro rocking either side to side or front to back as though you're holding a tiny newborn who's just about to fall asleep. Deep breath in. And you could avail yourself of this, <clears throat> pardon me, at any time. When things feel scary, if there's not someone right next to you who you could share a hug with or some non-sexual touch with, if there's no one around, the holding of the places in the body that constrict and feel cold, breathless, fast heart beating, tight jaw, activation, any physicalizations of your fight, flight, freeze, collapse, the yearn, the tend and befriend survival strategy, all of them generate from the physical in the body as animals. So we can take all that consciousness that we supposedly have as humans and bring awareness to the effect of these survival strategies of fight, flight, freeze, collapse, tend and befriend. Some of them are our usual go-tos. My particular ones, my top two are friendly. And then my second one is fight. So noticing where <clears throat> the freeze how that feels in the body, the fight, the hand, the jaw, the movements that generate from this animal imperative for us to survive. And having some empathy for these places that we sit when we're scared physically. It's becoming more popular to talk about emotions, not a moment too soon. And it's impossible to talk about emotions without noticing on some level that they are born in the body. A thought may trigger the survival strategy, but they all look like a holding or a movement or a burning 
or chills. And just for this last moment to put your hand on any part that you notice gets activated. For me, my hips get really activated. They, they lock. If it's your knees, if it's your legs that start pumping, <clears throat> if there's a part of us that is in the flight survival strategy, then the invitation would be to return to some place in your body that feels safe to, to return to. If being in the body is very unsafe, which it can so often feel like it is, what place might be safe enough to attempt to return to just for a moment? Could it be your cheeks, your fingertips, your shoulder blade? And just focusing your attention on that part. And if you can, put your hand on it and if you want to, go for it. If not, just paying searing attention to the place in your body that feels safe enough to dwell in when there is unpleasant sensation coursing through your body and your veins and your muscles. D deep breath in together. Noticing your jaw, noticing the speed with which your heart is beating, if you can attune to that sound or sensation of the thump our collective thumps. The breathing and the heartbeat implying that we are alive. And these survival strategies that, that keep the animal part of us alive, that serve us so beautifully when we're getting cut off in traffic or we're about to fall off a curb serve us so beautifully in those instances. And in theory, we would regulate right after, we would soothe ourselves right after, and the heartbeat would, ret would return. Our digestive system would start to operate again. All the things that stopped when we we're in fear, as we regulate together or alone over time, it can become habitual to notice the discharge of sweat, out breath, sighs, yawns, stomach starts to work again. You can hear gurgling sometimes. Some of us get really tired. We start to regulate. And just <clears throat> knowing that at any time during these weeks to come, that the interiority of your world, of your body, of your space, of your etheric body, of your whole self, is somewhere where our consciousness can help. With the warmth of our hand, with our attention, with our allowance of our animal movement and instinct for survival. and bringing a curiosity and a fascination to it, as well as any other voices that kick in to, I must do something, I must stop this, I'm going to die, I have to find some sort of panacea, I need a pill, I need alcohol, I need, I need to get away from these people. <clears throat> All of the movement that we so understandably respond to when we're feeling something unpleasant, especially if it's something that sends a message to our brain on some level that we might die. This state of alertness and emergency is meant to be short-lived for when a saber-toothed tiger comes. But often what's happening, and especially during these times, is that there's a saber-toothed tiger sitting at your front door staring at you the whole time. <clears throat> So just to have some curiosity, some fascination, and some empathy toward that which we run to or move to or jump out to or fight toward or lean into or medicate or run or freeze, to have some empathy toward that. 
And to know that when we look at each other, however well we're presenting ourselves, however functional we, however functional our lives seem, that there's a whole world underneath the presentation of movement and sensation and color and fear and all feelings concurrently happening often. And that socially, culturally, we're told that if someone says, how are you? Our answer is to be, I'm fine. And here you're safe and you're invited to be with yourself amongst others being with ourselves. To say, yes, there is a part of us that is fine and always will be. And then there's a part of us that's not fine. And all of these parts are welcome here. They're welcome with me. They're welcome with Justin and Anne. The parts that scare us, the parts that scare us in an exciting way. But as best as possible to keep coming back to the body whenever we can. Feet on the ground, deep breath in through the nose. <clears throat> Out through the mouth. And one more time, together, in through the nose. Fill the lungs up as much as you can. And when you think it's as full as you can, fill it. Fill it a little more if you can. And out through the mouth. And slowly when you're ready, come back to the space with, you, with each other. Welcome back. I remember, <clears throat> I may have shared this with some of you whom I've met before, because I saw some faces I know. But I remember when my son ever was, maybe he was three years old, he was in the kitchen and he was really upset and agitated. And I just walked up to him and I put my hand on his heart and I said, hey, sweetie, what's going on in there? And he said, mom, I can't go in, it's too scary. And I said, well, I'll come in with you. And then we went in together and we explored a little bit. It was, you know, he was three. So <laughs> I had to be careful not to impose my projection of how wonderful the interiority is. <laughs> and so he came out together. But that was a really big moment for me as a mom too, thinking like, wow, imagine this interior world that is so beautiful and so complex and yet so simple. Um, imagine we didn't have to go in alone. Mm -hmm. And that's when I mentioned yesterday that meditation sometimes is not the way to go. It's almost like going into this interior world is, can be for so many people such a refuge and an out breath and a grounding. And then for some of us at different times or just entirely going within can be terrifying. Because what, I'm going to go in and I'm going to talk to these really mean voices? That sounds fun. Um, <clears throat> but calibrating it, titrating it, so maybe the, maybe the interiority visit is 10 seconds. I got my shoulders, I'm out. You know, so spending as much time as you want or can in there. And some of us can spend hours in there. And some of us, and for me at times, like, I can't even, I go in every three weeks. <clears throat> so just playing with that. There's no right or wrong way to do it. And any portal in is the way to go. You could say, okay, I'm going to focus on my muscles. I'm going to focus on my, and if I see color, I'm going to focus on my bones. I'm going to focus on my blood. Just taking anything that is interior and, and letting that be the invitation in.
Justin. <laughs> One of the things I love that you mentioned in the meditation and that that is sort of a core quality that you bring to every interaction interior or with another person is that sense of curiosity and fascination. And I know you bring that to your own experience and I certainly see you bring that to um, every interaction you know, that, that you come to. And so I think that freshness of meeting ourselves almost for the first time and exploring our bodies as if we were just coming into a new place mm. and, and, and tasting the, the emotional tones and, and seeing the scenery in there of, of, of what appears broken and what appears on fire and what appears in distress mm. is that, that sense of curiosity is something that you've continually taught me over the years. It's, that's super helpful because it, it takes, a, it, it brings lightness to the parts that are hard to be with. Mm. Well, it's interesting. The curiosity piece was always really hard for me. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I lost your audio. So I'm talking over you right now. <laughs> I know you're saying something fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> um, you okay if I can start? Um, so, um, okay. My PPD brain can't remember what was. Anne, help me out here. What were you talking about? Curiosity. <laughs> yeah, curiosity. Sorry. This is just like, um, okay, so curiosity, um, for me, being curious about in here, yes, years, I just did not care. I was just like, all of this in here is way too much for me. I want to do everything that I can out here to, to soothe. And it took years. It took two full decades of asking for me the begged question of why, why do I need to know that the back of my knee looks purple and is shaking? Who cares? You know? <clears throat> but then the more that I've done it, the more I can go there and use it as a resource when I'm in trouble, mm -hmm. when I'm raging or when my kids are raging or, or feeling the 752 feelings they feel every 10 minutes to just be like, Oh, how do you know you're angry? How do you know you're happy? You know, is there a, is there a burst in the chest? How do you know, you know, so that this whole mechanism of being human isn't such a mystery. I mean, it's a fabulous mystery in one sense. It's a mind boggling mystery. And at the same time, the body is not that much of a mystery if we come at it from whatever angle we want to. If we want to come at it from color, we want to come at it from anatomy, Gray's anatomy. If we want to come at it from any angle at all, there's a million ways in and none of them are right or wrong. And some of the way in is going to be watching this as us and crying and going, wow, look at me. Yes. Look at what's coming out of my eye holes. You know, so it doesn't have to be some magnificent turning point, I guess, is the point. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, I know your curiosity. Um, yeah, curiosity. <laughs> Sorry, I did. Is, is there uh, probably wanting to hear from all of our community members as well? Yeah. So maybe Avery would yeah. um, like to take some questions and, and uh, everyone can use the uh, automatic hand raise and then Avery will unmute you and, and uh, you know, please bring your questions or your experience to, uh, to the big group. Yes. Yeah. Avery, do you have a question? Yeah, about? sorry. I didn't realize I was muted. Ella, go ahead. Oh, Ella, hi, it's me. <laughs> um, um, Oh, wow. I can't, I, um, I just feel so grateful to be here and <sighs> Justin, um, hearing you talk about, um, <sighs> curiosity and, and Alanis, your like openness to it and your curiosity to the curiosity, like, Oh, there's just so much I want to say right now. And I just want to cry. I'm just so, so grateful to be here. You have no idea. No idea. <sighs> welcome, welcome, welcome. All of you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Alanis. I love you. I, oh, you have no idea how much I love Big Sur. That's like my most favorite song of yours. Oh, I just had to share that. <laughs> so Thank happy you. to hear, yeah. 
Bless you. <sighs> Love you. Thank you. Love you. Thank you. Let yourself cry. That's the best thing to do. Let yourself yeah. give yourself permission to weep and wail. Yeah, I have to tell you that I, I, I love, I live to cry. And um, I'm on Prozac right now for my postpartum depression. I call it postpartum activity. Um, and it sucks because on Prozac, I can't cry as much as I want to. So I'll just be sitting there dying to cry. So when I see other people crying, I'm just vicariously going, yes, 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 please. Please move that, that beautiful, beautiful salty water. In, in Alanis, in your meditation, you invited us to touch ourselves in, in, a, in a soft way, in an intimate way, in a present way. And this is something that, that Anne also teaches. And I think, you know, in this environment where touch has been so sort of um, ignited as a dangerous thing, we want to remember. <laughs> You know, and touch each other at, at night. Um, I, I need to collapse onto someone's chest and just have some tears and just let it all go and just exhale because we are in a collective sort of flight mode. We're, we're bombarded with these really horrifying images. So just that, that just touch on the heart or that softness or that lying on someone's chest or holding your puppy or holding a stuffed animal, whatever it is, just that, that invitation that we got from Ella to soften into whatever is coming up is so the medicine that we need. Mm. Thank you, Justin. I just want to say those that don't have puppies or stuffed animals or a lover, myself, <laughs> touch yourself. <laughs> Take oils and goodness and just put oils and bathe yourself and ground yourself in, in, in that self-love. Touch yourself. <laughs> Sing it in. <clears throat> Yeah, and I would say with, the, with, with that too, I mean, even there are days where my, the voices of, toward myself are really, really violent and cruel. And the last thing I want to do is, is offer warmth or kindness to myself. And sometimes if I can just push through, you know, I think we talked about it briefly. I don't know if it was together alone or whether it was with a group. It's all, <clears throat> it was all over the last 24 hours, but watch, you know, it could just be wash, washing your hands. I mean, washing your hands is so such a big deal right now, but it could be anything. It could be brushing your teeth. It could be, you know, and then all the way to the, the beautiful invitation. And I thought about it all night last night. I was like, well, okay, what oil am I going to use? And am I going to put it in my hair? Am I going to, you know, so I'll be doing that later. And I'm so grateful for that because there is something grounding about, about almost having an exercise where you have to, non-sexually or sexually whatever 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 is happening for you whatever feels least triggering and the safest should we Can ask to dive into another yeah. yeah asmar oh hello um it's me um <laughs> thanks for providing this space to share our experiences um talking about curiosity um um, I have one thing to share that I feel it's a need for me and for many people is to feed our curiosity and feel it as an instinct, as a, an important thing for us. It, for myself, I think it helped me a lot to go in the nature and follow insects and watch insects very closely mm. and try to observe them from a very close point of view and I, I felt this was a way to feed my curiosity but then later I felt it was as important as eating food so it was later it just became a habit of feeding my my curiosity mm. but then yeah it's it's made me feel this mm, making my making me more close to my instincts mm. um, <clears throat> just felt like sharing this if anyone would like to give it a try i i think that we or for me i i learned a lot from insects mm. <laughs> from watching them from drawing them from feeling them <laughs> so beautiful uh, so beautiful and so yeah. incredible to watch the subtlety of insect movement and i also what you said, Asmar, about following your instincts, following your impulses, 
And, and to do that, you have to be deeply in touch with your body to even feel and hear and sense your impulses. So this is such a beautiful practice for all of us is that listening, what is the impulse now? And is there a yes there? So beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, and so, so many of us have had our impulses shamed. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of, you know, it sometimes gets a bad rep following the impulse. Um, you know, if, if the impulse is to do something that's destructive or act out or, you know, the impulse is its own movement. It's its own, it's, it's its own fear and yearning to do something to stop something. So if I'm feeling dis unpleasant sensation and I, I have an impulse to eat because I'm hungry, that's, that's an impulse that doesn't create challenge for us. Um, to follow an impulse that might be destructive in some way is an impulse. It's also just not who we are. It's this animating force. There's the animating force as I see it that allows us to move, for, move forward, be inspired, express our essential selves. And then there's these impulses that some of them, it's almost, they can be categorized like some of them are animal. Some of them are, are animated by love. Some of the impulses are just, I'm learning and growing. I'm two years or one year old and I'm trying to walk and the impulse is to move over there. So to really even be curious, bring that curiosity to your own impulses and asking yourself, is this, a, is this an animal movement towards something? Is this an inspiration movement? You know, as opposed to um, a lot of times, it's certainly our, my parents' generation really seeing that impulses and who the person is, they, they're not the same thing. Like who you are, your essential self is animated sometimes as your essential self. And sometimes the impulses can be a running away or an aversion or a yearning. And just to notice which one is which, if, there's, if there can be some distinction there. And, and following that oh, immediately is, is a lot of the work that we are doing today. And I was wondering, um, <clears throat> Anne, if you might lead us um, into some immediacy expressed through the pen, expressed through writing, and then we'll, we'll also explore that immediacy in interaction with each other in, in just a little bit after that. In groups, yeah. Yes, that sounds great, Justin. And I'm just going to piggyback Alana's after, <laughs> piggyback. Um, <laughs> we were talking about fight, flight, or freeze, and also the fear that comes up right now in these times. And, and yesterday, I said Happy Cock Church, and I looked out at people's faces are like, what the heck did she just say? And to me, it was great fear. I'm going to share this little brief story with you. Mm -hmm. I had this impulse to create a church, non-religious of the irreverent and irreverent, just sharing stories where we minister to one another through our stories, because I knew the power of sharing stories. And I live in Kauai, where the cocks are, you heard them yesterday, the roosters constantly. And I had and I had this idea, Happy Cock Church, for two years, but the fear gripped me. I was so scared. And I'd hear Rumi chiding me in the middle of the night. The night has secrets to tell you. Do not go back to sleep. Tell me what you really want. And what I wanted was this. This felt my impulse to do this thing, yet the fear gripped me. And you might have that. And the fear gripped me because there's a lot at stake. The title itself is triggering. I might lose my audience. You know, I'm known as a solo performer, as a, a comedian, and to go in this direction is new. Mm. It's not known. It's unknown territory. Mm. And we're all in unknown territory right now. And yet, we're being called to take another step. And what is that step for you? And it's the step often you don't want to take, which is, okay, the step might be saying no to something that no longer serves you. The step might be me pushing send and inviting people to come to Happy Cock Church and say, here, come share your story. Because that, that cock illuminates in all sacred traditions from going to darkness to light. And the words are triggering cock, church, and happy. So when we're triggered, we stop listening to one another. And I thought, create a place where we can listen and hold space, even though we might not be in agreement and alignment. And that's what we're doing with each other. We're holding beautiful space for each other when we share our stories in these small groups. Mm. So as we write right now, I think resistance and fear teaches us 
almost like oh, this is the direction I need to go. Even though I'm scared, I can feel this impulse to go there. Like your impulse as more to go to the insect, to focus your attention on the insect. Mm. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful impulse. It's, it's, mm. it's a drilling down on that very small, small thing. So the writing prompt around today would be around this fear, the, this resistance. And so we could take it two different ways. We could take the Rumi quote, the Sufi mystic, the night has secrets to tell you, do not go back to sleep. Tell me what you really want. And so writing prompt would be for four minutes, what you really want. Mm. Or the second writing prompt could be, what's the next step you need to take, the step you don't want to take? And that's, a, that's where that resistance and fear kicks in. So what is that step there? And you can hear it. It's, it's roomy. It's that inner voice. It's that wisdom saying, come on, come on. What is it? So tell me that next step you don't want to take. So four <laughs> minutes. Let's write on this. Either what you really want or the step that you, be, you hear yourself being called to take and you're resisting. Okay. Anybody out there? <clears throat> Courage that one might want to share. Raise your hand. Oh my God, eight people. Who's going for it, Avery? Susan, did you, you were, I think you were before we were going for the writing prompt. Did you have something? Sure. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for this opportunity to share. Um, I'm being called to step away from my survival instincts to let the universe provide me with what I really want. I have all the tools as an herbalist, healer, and beekeeper to connect with people and offer my gifts to the world on the interwebs. But instead, I keep using the tools in the back of my truck, the shovel, the rake, the tarp, to pull up the edge and mulch four yards. Yesterday was my second day in a row gardening seven hours straight, bending over, carrying heavy things. I really pushed the limits of my body. I woke up many times throughout the night, unlike other nights when I have slept right through. My body was in pain, a reminder to soften and allow my desires to manifest. Today I was interviewed online and the feedback I received was enough to realize I need to be sharing and teaching, that I can put the rake down and watch the universe provide what I need to rake in abundance in a softer, gentler way. I love that. Put the rake down, Susie. <laughs> it's great to hear that line. Yeah. And, and I'm then just thinking, uh, just in the interest of everyone getting to share, because I know there's so much richness that was discovered in that, that writing practice, maybe we could go to small groups so that everyone will, will have a chance to share what they found in that last meditation and what came up for them in, um, in the writing practice as well. Um, Avery, would you mind taking us to small groups? Yay. I love everybody arriving by the teleporter. It's so amazing. <laughs> Rebecca. Yeah. So in the spirit of curiosity, um, Alanis would love to have more questions and sharing on anything, on questions that you brought, questions that are coming up inside, questions from our meditation, from what she was speaking about, from the writing, from the small group. So Avery, um, I know you've got a stack of, of folks. Please. There we uh, go. Chris go and Hello? Hi. Hi. Um, first, I just wanted to say, Anne, you're so amazing. Um, <laughs> your words are just resonating like throughout my whole entire body. It's like electricity that I feel. And um, I think that sometimes when we're on our way somewhere, we need some sign 
that we're on the right track and you're that sign for me. Like you're that spark for me that I feel. So I appreciate you so much. And Alanis, thank you for putting this together and um, doing this because I, I just think it's amazing. And I'm, I love the little breakout groups too and what goes on in there. Mm -hmm. um, in my group, I said that I couldn't really think too much about what I wanted except for this one thing. And I said, I want the stillness uh, that this time offers us with the freedom that the before time gave me. It's like, how do I find that in this? Because I just feel like I, I don't know how, but I'm trying to manage that in some way. And in a way, I, I think I've been doing some things that um, I probably wouldn't have done before. I, I, I talked to the group yesterday about buying a ukulele and never had any music experience before and teaching myself and um, <laughs> how I wouldn't have done that because I would have only done things that were products needed to be developed and why would I just do that? But this is just giving me the freedom to just play with it and teach myself and learn. And I'm, I'm like, wow, I can, I can play a song now. Um, but um, I want to take that, whatever that is, when we're back on the other side of this and move, have that like energy combined with feeling that stillness, but in amongst all that move again. It's hard. I don't know how else to explain it, but maybe you guys can. Our, yeah, I mean, part of what I'm hearing, if, and correct me if I'm wrong always, um, is, is the, the freedom that you're talking about. So the essence of the freedom is to be able to actually have pure joy, this unmitigated joy with what's in front of you, in this case, the ukulele. Right. Because uh, before lockdown or whatever the words we're going to use, um, you know, so much of life, this is such a work addicted culture, right? So, so much of life is your worth is in your productivity you know, you're only as good as your last whatever, your last record or your last project or your last. So, so many messages to us humans that we are only worth something is for producing something. And it completely takes away, you called it freedom and you express the joy you have with ukulele. I mean, that's part of what we're here to do. That is a self-expression. And because we've lived in a culture and been conditioned in a culture that says, well, that doesn't matter unless you produce a ukulele record that wins a Grammy, <laughs> you know, or unless, you know, so, so, so we're basically told that our own unfettered expression and joy means nothing. So it's really being an activist and a rebel going, hey, you know what, I'm going to work. It's not like I'm going to go from working my ass off, meeting deadlines to all of a sudden I'm just going <laughs> to... I mean, maybe you, maybe you need to just kumbaya off into the sunset with a ukulele. Maybe that's exact. <laughs> but, um, but introducing, you know, we could use the word hobby. We could use the word just pure joy. And you know what I used to do? Because everything I did for so many years was, wow, I can share this with people. This could help, you know, or this might serve as fill in the blank. I started challenging myself to do things that I shared with nobody. So I take hundreds of thousands of photographs that bring me pure joy that I'll never share. So, so I don't know if that speaks to what you are curious about, um, yeah. but that would be one, one piece is just letting the human experience have the joy that is our birthright. It's our birthright to be expressed and, and shining you know, <laughs> and to be excited and curious. I mean, I look at my kids, you know, I'll nurse my son and I'm just oxytocin filled and all happy. And he's just like, talk to the hand mom. And he's just so curious. He just wants to see everything. And I'm like that pure, pure curiosity of, you know, my daughter might've wanted to have seen the, the, the blanket in the corner, but he wants to see this plug over here. And mm -hmm. it's so unique to each person. What pulls us, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, my dream would be to be holed up with a book and read three books cover to cover to someone else. That's a nightmare, you know? So, so for them, it might be, you know, going to a bouncy house. So just really listening to your unique, you, your unique essential self, knowing that some of them were, some of those things we're going to exploit for money, for income, for, for self-definition, for, for very agenda reasons. And then there are other things that we can do that are really unfettered and not exploited because exploitation, conscious exploitation to serve is lovely. It is what it is exploitation of the soul in that we're nothing without this, 
product is a violent perception. It's really mean to humans. So keeping the balance of, yeah, I want to make an income. I want to be responsible. I want to meet my deadlines. And I want to have joy. I want to have pleasure. You know, we don't want to waste this lifetime. These bodies are funny. They, they can have such deep pain and such great pleasure. And, you know, it's up to us to see which ones we want to dwell in once in a while if we can. Thank you. Chris, I loved what you, you said, this parody, this pairing between stillness and freedom, because this is something I see so much with Anne and, and Alanis and in my own experience is that when I'm in stillness, I'm waiting for the impulse to buy the ukulele, to reach out and say, I love you, to do the workshop, to write the book. Like it's, it's out of stillness that everything mm. that is deeply aligned with us comes from. You know, so I love that you name that because I see that happen so much with the creative forces in the world. Um, and in, in myself, you know, everything comes in, in that silent void of nothing. You know, sometimes Alana says, you know, when I'm, when I'm really bored, I know something amazing is coming and I just stay with it and stay with it with that curiosity. So thanks for naming that process of being in the nothingness, waiting in this space of emptiness for this divine to come and then following that impulse when you know it's there and then saying yes to it. Mm. Chris, thank you for your beautiful words to me that I would help as a sign for you. And I just have to share right before, I almost chickened out on doing it and I was leading a workshop and I, I told a student and he goes, and I've got these horrible tattoos on my arm. I wanna get rid of them but I think this is why I kept them. And on, the t on his arm, here's a sign, was a rooster and the word faith. So <laughs> those signs and symbols are there when you start focusing, they just, I'm like, holy shit, I gotta do it, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right, Becca. Hey, let's see, hey guys. Hi. Hi. Hi, Anne. I was just going to share what I wrote. Um, you know, for me, this is about, I've been getting involved in some uh, major political thing and it's dangerous what I'm doing. And at the same time, I don't want to call the danger to me, but I have to do it. So it's like about that fight between like feeling safe and also knowing what I'm doing is dangerous. So anyway, this is what, this is the next step. I was inspired by the next step. <sighs> The next step, a long, dangerous walk. The leader speaker wasn't planning a step into politics. The crumbling of the creative freedom, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. My home, my fight for the least of us, houseless elders, freelance, the word free. My California golden state is bullied status gangsters who didn't read this law, burning tent cities, into my beloved California. And the call to step in, out into a light that might call the monsters of power to come towards me. I have to see them, No, they might come, but not call them into me, destroying. I need to love them somehow, a mirror. The speaker leader will be safe and sound and in this fight shine the light of freedom. In my throat, I'm sobbing and terrified. Becca, what I, what I loved about that was that you knew that you had to love it, even though it was a terror, even though it was scary, you're going forward, you're at that choice point, right? And so you're naming it so beautifully in this writing, but you care so deeply. That's why that emotion's there. You know, you can feel, ah, I need to do this. I want to do this. And you articulated it beautifully. Oh, thank, and I can hear the passion. I can hear it in your voice. And, and I love expressing that when we follow that impulse, when we follow that immediacy, it's not always pretty. When we know we have to do something, it can also be torturous. You know, we're often chose to, chose, chose to do things that are very, very difficult and stretch us. And I, I know that from, from being with Alanis in the creative process. You know, that, that sometimes birthing whatever it is, whether it's a book or a nonprofit or a church or a new way of being or a relationship takes everything that we have, but yet we know we, we have to do it. So it's so beautiful when we bring along 
all of that um, storm that comes along with that impulse that we're saying yes to. Mm. And the and the idea of safety too is a fascinating one because. It's almost, I, 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 as I want to do, I see them in categories. Like there is safety emotionally in a relationship. Um, there is, as a human body, we are unsafe when we step into roles that are dangerous, as you said. The lack of safety can be there. And then the invitation in that case would be spending as much time as possible where you're emotionally, physically safe to compensate for those moments of activism where you feel really unsafe. You know, so for me, when I was in my 20s, I kept thinking, I'm, I just want safety. I just want to feel safe. I just want to feel safe. And the truth is, so many people said to me, there are a lot of environments, Alanis, where you're just not going to feel safe in them. You know, so it's almost like I had to pace myself, you know. And so one, one thought around this could be to really explore the word safety, you know. Safety how? You know, is my body safe? Are my, are my feelings safe? Is my psyche safe? You know, and then to be really discerning and, and, and playing with your boundaries in environments where it's more and more dangerous, our boundaries are more opaque and more and thick, you know? And then as we move back into our beloved, in our beloved, with our beloveds, our friends, our partners, our, our dogs, whomever, you know, then we can notice, okay, so I feel physically safe here. I can soften the boundary. I can soften this, you know, sometimes we have to put a straight up wall. If we're in a political environment where, where the environment we're in is being very emotionally or politically or psychically violent, thick boundaries, you know, and then I would just want to make sure that we have a compensatory experience of feeling safe somewhere, you know, and it could even be in our imagination. There are times where I'm alone and I feel really unsafe and I just think of Justin or Anne or I'll think of my kids or I'll think you know and then all of a sudden there's an effect in my body but but to the the idea of feeling safe was something that I really wanted to feel always and I realized that it was it was contextually dependent you know so I just want to give send a hyper beam of love to your body when you're in those environments that feel dangerous or, or are dangerous mm. and then to find some spaces where where you can really feel fully safe. Yeah, I love this conversation about safety. I was just thinking about my experience when you were leading us through the meditation earlier and creating this physical intimacy with ourselves and this safety that comes from being quiet and being attentive to ourselves and being soft with ourselves, being curious about how we're feeling and where we're holding. And then I was thinking about the story you told about Ever and going in with him and I was just thinking that with the work that we've done in these two sessions it would be great to practice that going in I thought we might spend some time going in and meeting a particular part that might have some wisdom and some gifts that we can use in the next few months so if you're willing now to let your eyes gently close and again letting your feet find the ground Getting really, really comfortable, just settling in, and immediately just noticing in your own chest, in your own body, how does it feel? Using your breath, bring it in, and letting go, and taking another breath in, and letting it go, and Using your breath almost to scan and just notice if there's any place it's holding and just noticing and feeling what your level of safety in this moment is. And then if you're willing to take the invitation that Alanis offered ever, bring her in with you or bring anyone else that has you feel safe and secure and taken care of in with you as we drop inside. And then again, using your breath in and out and in and out just to deepen and deepen and deepen 
And just imagine that your body is falling, falling, falling deeper into your own consciousness. And it's almost like you have a weight with you and you're just floating downward and downward and downward. And you might even notice that as you float downward into the depth of your consciousness that the temperature gets a little colder and you can feel the environment change and maybe the intensity and the air pressure feels different as you're dropping down into the center of your consciousness. And then allowing yourself to sense yourself landing in a chair, a perfect chair. Actually, you notice that it's a golden chair and this chair is so comfortable that it's almost like it was made just for you. It's so comfortable that it's hard to even feel where you end and it begins. And as you nestle into this chair and look around, notice that you're in the most magnificent deep forest. And as your eyes take in the environment around you, the plants and the trees and the quality of sunlight, that your ears hear the sound of the forest. Maybe there's gurgling water and birds and rustling, all sorts of forest bugs and wildlife stirring. And you can feel the aliveness of the forest holding you. And as your eyes scan the periphery all around you, you notice that just a few feet away, there's another golden chair, almost exactly like yours. But in this golden chair, there's a being. And almost instantly you realize that this is the being that you've come to meet today. And as you breathe and use your mind's eye to take this being in, to sense them, just trusting however you sense, maybe it's a clear vision or just, just a sense of their energy. See what you notice about this being. They may appear to you as a person, or an animal, some type of other creature. Whatever form they've taken, just breathing and checking in with your heart and asking, does this being feel familiar? And now moving to the edge of your seat and getting as close to this part of you as you possibly can. Notice, how does it feel to be close to them? How does it feel to be near them? And with a whisper or maybe just an internal knowing, here I am the long forgotten part of you that you will need in the coming months and years. And the long forgotten part of you that you will need in the coming months and years. I am here for you and you are safe. Letting those words land. Notice if your heart just received those words or if it somehow wants to keep them out, if there's some resistance, just notice what's there, no need to change anything. Continuing to use your breath as your vehicle to keep things moving, to keep sensing. And now just allowing yourself to be curious about this part that you're gonna need in the coming months and years and asking this part, what's your name? Trusting whatever you receive. Maybe you get a clear name or again, just a sense. And then asking this part, 
What are you here to teach me? What are you here to teach me? And listening with your whole body. Using your breath, using your receptivity, and then holding the hand or the knee of this part, and almost like you're watching a movie together. Ask this part to show you how do you forget or lose touch with this part? How did this part slip away? from your immediate access. How did that happen? And just again, allow yourself to sense whatever you do. Trusting whatever you get. And then asking this part, why have you come now? Why now? Begin breathing, receiving, knowing that you're getting exactly what you need, doesn't matter what you think. And then asking this part, what's the most important thing for me to remember every day? What's the most important thing for me to remember? Listening, receiving, sensing, trusting. Again, letting whatever answer come, just come however it does. And now asking this part for a simple action or practice that you can do every day to help you remember what it's come to teach you to help you integrate the lessons that it's giving you. What's a simple practice you can do every day, or a simple action you can take every day. Trusting whatever you receive. Letting whatever you receive just land in your own body. Again, using your breath making sure that you understand this practice or action, asking any questions you have. And now asking this part, again, as if you're watching a movie together to show you what would be possible if you were to embrace this practice, if you were to embrace this daily action, if you were to really get what this part has to teach you, what it's brought you today. How would your life be different? Just like you're watching a movie together. See what comes, what would be different? How would your life shift if you really embrace what this part has for you? And just checking inside and seeing if you're willing to receive the gifts of what this part has to offer you. And if you're not willing to receive the gifts, seeing what you are willing to receive from this part. And if you are willing to receive the teaching, the offering that this part has brought you, just letting it know energetically or with a nod just internally, and just breathing, and feeling that yes, that willingness to take these practices, to take this teaching, and to use it as a resource, to let it shift your life, your consciousness, feeling that yes. And not just allowing yourself to feel the support of this part, 
Just letting that support really land. And then allowing yourself to feel the support of all your wise and strong internal parts. Feeling all that supporting you inside. And extending that awareness to feel the support of all the family and friends, the people who love you, the people that have been in your life and have moved on from your life are supporting you. And then letting that support grow even bigger and feeling the support of this virtual community and the whole world who's experiencing just what you're experiencing in all different forms, the ground being ripped from them and everything in flux. Feel their support no matter what their circumstances are. Yeah. Now again, turning to this part that's come to meet you today and rising up, and if it feels right, giving them a hug and feel them as you hug them, taking their place inside of you, knowing that you'll always know just where to find them knowing that you won't have to take any big journeys, that they're just a few breaths away anytime you need them. It can be in the elevator, it can be in the bathroom, it can be brushing your teeth, they're right here. And knowing, knowing that you'll have access to all your parts and all your wisdom in the same way, and that the safety and the intimacy experience in these sessions is also available. Just a few breaths, just a little deepening of awareness, and you can find yourself right here. And putting your hand on your heart, one hand on your heart, one hand on your belly, and just thanking yourself. Just saying thank you for this time, for this willingness to go in, for your courage, for all the ways you show up. And again, feeling your body sitting, your feet on the floor. And gently coming back and letting your eyes open. And being in this virtual room with this virtual community. So um, we're approaching a couple of minutes um, toward our end for the moment. I've jokingly told shared with Justin and Ann that we're just going to do this every day, so not to worry. <laughs> that would be my dream. Um, if there's anything that came up during that time, if you were journaling about it during the gorgeous deep dive with Justin, um, feel free to journal at your, at your leisure after we jump off together. Um, one last invitation I have for you during this time, um, before we meet again, if we do, is in that very same journal. Um, Anne asked me to show my journal. <laughs> um, is to write down on the left side of the sheet, just write the word resources at the top, if you want. On the left side, write down what you consider to be your healthy resources. Taking a bath, eating high nutrient food, doing yoga, all the stuff that when you do it or you go or you move to do it, you think, yeah, this is right. I'm good. This is awesome. Then on the right side of the page, I want you to write the resources that you have that you have maybe some shame around that you think, oh, that's not the healthiest resource. Um, or I really wouldn't want to let anyone know that that's what I do every day at three o'clock or 11 or or four in the morning. And so you'll have two lists in front of you of resources on the left that, is, that are considered to be healthy and resources on the right that's considered to be unhealthy or somehow shame-filled. Then when you have a minute on a third page, I want you to mix them up all together into one giant cluster of words. And have it be somewhere where you can look at it and reference it. 
and to up-level your trust of your own self that whatever you move toward, as best as we can possibly suspend judgment, which almost seems like an impossible task, that at any given moment, if we need a resource, we have a piece of paper with every single resource that we honestly have for ourselves. And in those moments, we can choose from whichever ones we want. Attempting as best as possible to suspend judgment. And seeing what these resources afford us. It could be the imagination of someone that you love on the beach with you. It could be some of the things we all mentioned earlier. Um, I don't even know if it's possible on Zoom for, for us to kind of throw out resources for a minute before we all go. Is there, would that turn into a whole kerfuffle audio wise? <laughs> if we all sort of shared? Is what that do do? Let's try it. <laughs> Say again, sweet. People could write them on the chat, or we could just oh, okay. unmute and have a have a big kerfuffle as well. We could have fun. a, a resource SoundCloud. Okay. Um, how about that one? We write. Uh, actually, I like the kerfuffle. I live for kerfuffles. Um, so, want to do one moment, Avery, <laughs> of um, everyone just sharing words of healthy and unhealthy resources during this time. Sure. So, Okay. Everyone can unmute now. Okay. So uh, go for it. <laughs> Laughter. Chocolate. Meditation. Being in nature. Food. Walking. Now sleep. Sleep. Quiet. Definitely eating too much bread. Transcends eating. Living my dharma. Legs along. Enjoying nature. A long bath. Exercise. Happy walking. Taking a nap. Hiking. Hiking. Vitamins. Hiking. Vitamins. Crying. Spending time in nature. Walking the puppies. Kissing. My wine. Feeding my family. Walking in the lunch. Watching TV. Reading a whole book in one day. I actually, that was less of a kerfuffle than I thought. I caught a lot of those and I furiously wrote a lot of them down. So keep going on those reasons. Um, and um, I really, really enjoyed this time with you each so much. I love working with Justin. I love working with Justin and Anne. You are two of my favorite people on this whole planet. I see a lot of faces here of people I know and whom I adore. Hi. And um, we'll figure out what we can do in terms of continuing this, this kind of connection. It would break my heart to think that we have these two days together and that and that we jump the ship after that. So we'll, we'll brainstorm how we can stay in touch and maybe make this somewhat of a consistent thing here and there. But in the meantime, you know, we, we dove into as much as we possibly could in the limited amount of time. And I just, I'm sweating right now, I'm soaked. So whenever I'm sweating, that's, that's a good sign for me that, that there's been a lot of energy moving and a lot of love. Um, it's been torturous not to interact as much with you, but I have to tell you, this is such a gift to be able to do, knowing that otherwise I wouldn't see you at all. And um, I love you so much, each of you. And Justin and Anne, thank you. Thank you, 1440. And to be continued. And we can all sort of unmute ourselves and say a, a goodbye at the same time, kerfuffle style. <laughs> I love you all. Bye. 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 Ask a question. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Love you. Love you. Love you all. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you. Love you.